The Story Girl Chapter 24 The Bewitchment of Pat We were all in doleful dumps, at least all we young fry were, and even the grown-ups were sorry and condescended to take an interest in our troubles. Pat, our own dear frolicsome Patty, was sick again, very, very sick. On Friday he moped and refused his saucer of new milk at milking time. The next morning he stretched himself down on the platform by Uncle Roger's back door, laid his head on his black paws, and refused to take any notice of anything or anybody. In vain we stroked and entreated and brought him titbits. Only when the story girl caressed him did he give one plaintive little mew, as if to ask pitifully why she could not do something for him. At that, Cecily and Felicity and Sarah Ray all began crying, and we boys felt choky. Indeed, I caught Peter behind Aunt Olivia's dairy later in the day, and if ever a boy had been crying, I vow that boy was Peter. Nor did he deny it when I taxed him about it. But he would not give in that he was crying about Patty. Nonsense! What were you crying for, then? I said. I'm crying because... "'Because my Aunt Jane is dead,' said Peter defiantly. "'But your Aunt Jane died two years ago,' I said skeptically. "'Well, ain't that all the more reason for crying?' retorted Peter. "'I've had to do without her for two years, "'and that's worse than if it had been just a few days.' "'I believe you are crying because Pat is so sick,' I said firmly. "'As if I'd cry about a cat,' scoffed Peter, "'and he marched off whistling.' Of course, we had tried the lard and powder treatment again, smearing Pat's paws and sides liberally, but to our dismay, Pat made no effect to lick it off. I tell you, he's mighty sick cat, said Peter darkly. When a cat don't take care to lick himself, he's pretty far gone. If we only knew what was the matter with him, we might do something, sobbed the story girl, stroking her poor pet's unresponsive head. "'I could tell you what's the matter with him, but you'd laugh at me,' said Peter. We all looked at him. "'Peter Craig, what do you mean?' said Felicity. "'Exactly what I say.' "'Then if you know what's the matter with Patty, tell us,' commanded the story girl, standing up. She said it quietly, but Peter obeyed. "'I think he would have obeyed if she, in that tone, and, with those eyes, had ordered him to cast himself into the depths of the sea. I know I should. He's bewitched. That's what the matter is with him, said Peter half defiantly, half shamefacedly. Bewitched? Nonsense. There now, what did I tell you? complained Peter. The story girl looked at Peter, and at the rest of us, and then at poor Pat. How could he be bewitched? she asked and who could bewitch him? I don't know how he was bewitched, said Peter. I'd have to be a witch myself to know that. But Peg Bowen bewitched him. Nonsense, said the story girl again. All right, said Peter. You don't have to believe me. If Peg Bowen could bewitch anything, I don't believe she would. And why should she bewitch Pat? asked the story girl. Everybody here at Uncle Alex is always kind to her. "'I'll tell you why,' said Peter. "'Thursday afternoon, when you fellows were all at school, Peg Bowen came here. "'Your Aunt Olivia gave her a lunch, a good one. "'You may laugh at the notion of Peg being a witch, "'but I notice you folks are always awful good to her when she comes, "'and awful careful never to offend her. "'Aunt Olivia would be good to any poor creature, "'and so would Mother,' said Felicity. "'And, of course, nobody wants to offend Peg, because... She is spiteful, and she once set fire to a man's barn in Markdale when he offended her. But she isn't a witch. That's ridiculous. All right, but wait till I tell you. When Peg Bowen was leaving, Pat was stretched out on the steps. She trampled on his tail. You know Pat doesn't like to have his tail meddled with. He slewed himself around and clawed her bare foot. If you'd just seen the look she gave him, you'd know what she that she was a witch. And she went off down the lane, muttering and throwing her hands round, just like she did in Lem Hill's cow pasture. 
She put a spell on Pat. That's what she did. He's been sick ever since. We looked at each other in a miserable, perplexed silence. We were only children, and we believed that there had been such things as witches once upon a time, and Peg Bowen was an eerie creature. If that's so, though I can't believe it, we can't do anything, the story girl said drearily. Pat must die. Cecily began to weep afresh. I'd do anything to save Pat's life, she said. There's nothing we can do, said Felicity impatiently. I suppose, sobbed Cecily, we might go to Peg Bowen and ask her to forgive Pat and take the spell off him. She might, if we apologize real humble. At first we were appalled by the suggestion. We didn't believe that Peg Bowen was a witch. But to go to her, to seek her out in the mysterious woodland retreat of hers, which was invested with all the terrors of the unknown, and that this suggestion should come from timid little Cecily, of all people, but then there was poor Pat. Would it do any good? said the story girl, desperately. Even if she did make Pat sick, I suppose it would only make her crosser if we went and accused her of bewitching him. Besides, she didn't do anything of the sort. But there was some uncertainty in the story girl's voice. It wouldn't do any harm to try, said Cecily. If she didn't make him sick, it won't matter if she's cross. It won't matter to Pat, but it might to one who goes to her, said Felicity. She isn't a witch, but she's a spiteful old woman, and goodness knows what she'd do to us if she caught us. I'm scared of Peg Bowen, and I don't care who knows it. Ever since I can mind Ma, she's been saying, If you're not good, Peg Bowen will come and catch you. If I thought she really made Pat sick and could make him better, I'd try to pacify her somehow, said the story girl decidedly. I'm frightened of her, too. But just look at poor darling Patty. We looked at Patty, who continued to stare fixedly before him with unwinking eyes. Uncle Roger came out and looked at him also, with what seemed to us positively brutal unconcern. I'm afraid it's all up for Pat, he said. Uncle Roger, said Cecily imploringly. Peter says Peg Bowen has bewitched Pat for scratching her. Do you think it can be so? Did Pat scratch Peg? asked Uncle Roger, with a horror-stricken face. Dear me, dear me, the mystery solved. Poor Pat. Uncle Roger nodded his head as if resigned himself and Pat to the worst. Do you really think Peg Bowen is a witch, Uncle Roger? demanded the story girl. Do I think Peg Bowen a witch, my dear Sarah? What do you think of a woman who can turn herself into a black cat whenever she likes? Is she a witch, or is she not? I leave it to you. Can Peg Bowen turn herself into a black cat? asked Felix, staring. It's my belief that this is the least of Peg Bowen's accomplishments, answered Uncle Roger. It's the easiest thing in the world for a witch to turn herself into any animal you choose to mention. Yes, Pat is bewitched. No doubt of that. Not the least in the world. What are you telling those children such stuff for? asked Olivia, passing her way to the well. It's an irresistible temptation, answered Uncle Roger, strolling over to carry her pail. You can see your Uncle Roger believes Peg is a witch, said Peter. And you can see Aunt Olivia doesn't, I said, and I don't either. See here, said the story girl reasonably. I don't believe it, but there may be something in it. Suppose there is. The question is, what can we do? I'll tell you what to do, said Peter. I'd take a present for Peg and ask her to make Pat well. I wouldn't let on I thought she'd make him sick. Then she couldn't be offended, and maybe she'd take the spell off. I think we'd better all give her something, said Felicity. I'm willing to do that. But who's going to take the presents to her? We must all go together, said the story girl. I won't, cried Sarah Ray in terror. I wouldn't go near Peg Bowen's house for the world, no matter who was with me. I've thought of a plan, said the story girl. Let's all give her something, 
as Felicity says, and let us write a letter to her, a real nice, polite letter. Then let us all go up to her place this evening, and if we see her outside, we'll just go quietly and set the things down before her with the letter, and say nothing but come respectfully away. Can Peg read a letter? I asked. Oh, yes. Aunt Olivia says she's a good scholar. She went to school and was a smart girl until she became crazy. I'll write it very plain. What if we don't see her? asked Felicity. We'll put the things on the doorstep and then leave them. She may be miles away over the country by that time, said Cecily, and never find them until it's too late for Pat. But it's the only thing we can do. What can we give her? We mustn't offer her money, said the story girl. She's very indignant when anyone does that. She says she isn't a beggar. But she'll take anything else. I shall give her my string of blue beads. She's fond of finery. I'll give her a sponge cake I made this morning, said Felicity. I guess she doesn't get sponge cake very often. I'm nothing but the rheumatism ring I got as a premium for selling needles last winter, said Peter. I'll give her that. Even if she hasn't got rheumatism, it's a real handsome ring. It looks like solid gold. I'll give her one of those little jars of cherry preserves I made, said Cecily. I won't go near her, quivered Sarah Ray. But I want to do something for Pat, and I'll send her that piece of apple leaf lace I knitted last week. I decided to give the redoubtable Peg some apples from my birthday tree, and Dan declared he would give her a plug of tobacco. Oh, won't you be insulted? exclaimed Felix, rather horrified. Nah, grinned Dan. Peg chews tobacco like a man. She'd rather have it than your rubbishy peppermints. I can tell you that. I'll run down to old Mrs. Sampson's and get a plug. Now we must write the letter and take it and the presents to her right away before it gets dark, said the story girl. We adjourn to the granary to indict the important document which the story girl was to compose. How shall I begin it? she asked in perplexity. It would never do to say, Dear Peg, or Dear Miss Bowen. It sounds too ridiculous. Besides, nobody knows whether she's Miss Bowen or not, said Felicity. She went to Boston when she grew up, and some say she was married up there and her husband ran away, and that's why she went crazy. Well, how am I to address her? asked the story girl in despair. Peter again came to the rescue with a practical suggestion. Begin it, respectful madam, he said. Ma has a letter a school trustee once writ to my Aunt Jane, and that's how it began. Respected madam, wrote the story girl, we want to ask a very great favor of you, and we hope you will kindly grant it if you can. Our favorite cat, Patty, is very sick, and we are afraid he's going to die. Do you think you could cure him? And will you please try? We are all so fond of him, and he is such a good cat, and has no bad habits. Of course, if any one was to trample his tail, he will scratch us. But you know a cat can't bear to have his tail trampled on. It's a very tender part of him, and his only way of preventing it, and he doesn't mean any harm. If you can cure Patty, and for us we will always be very, very grateful to you. The accompanying small offerings are a testimonial of our respect and gratitude, and we entreat you to honor us by accepting them. Very respectfully yours, Sarah Stanley. I tell you that last sentence has a fine sound, said Peter admiringly. I didn't make that up, admitted the story girl, honestly. I read it somewhere and remembered it. I think it's too fine, criticized Felicity. Pegbone won't know the meaning of such big words. But it was decided to leave them in, and we all signed the letter. Then we got our testimonials and started on our reluctant journey to the domain of the witch. Sarah Ray would not go, of course, but she volunteered to stay with Pat while we were away. We did not think it necessary to inform the grown-ups of our errand or its nature. Grown-ups had such peculiar views. They might forbid our going at all, and they would certainly laugh at us. 
Peg Bowen's house was nearly a mile away, even by the short cut past the swamp and up the wooded hill. We went down through the brook field and over the little plank bridge in the hollow, half lost in it, surrounding sea of farewell summers. When we reached the green gloom of the woods beyond, we began to feel frightened, but nobody would admit it. We walked very closely together, and we did not talk. When you are near the retreat of witches and folk of that ilk, the less you say the better, for their feelings are so notoriously touchy. Of course, Peg wasn't a witch, but it was best to say on the safe side. Finally, we came to the lane which led directly to her abode. We were all very pale now, and our hearts were beating. The red September sun hung low between the, ta the tall spruces to the west. It did not look to me just right for a sun. In fact, everything looked uncanny. I wish our errand were well over. A sudden bend of the lane brought us out into the little clearing where Peg's house was before we were half ready to see it. In spite of my fear, I looked at it with some curiosity. It was a small, shaky building with a saggy roof, set amid a perfect jungle of weeds. To our eyes, the odd things about it were just that there was no entrance on the ground floor, as there should be in any respectable house. The only door was in the upper story, and was reached by a flight of rickety steps. There was no sign of life about the place except a slight ill omen, a large black cat sitting on the topmost step. We thought of Uncle Roger's gruesome hint. Could that black cat be Peg? Nonsense. But still, it didn't look like an ordinary cat. It was so large, and had such green, malicious eyes. Plainly, there was something out of the common about the beastie. In a tense... Breathless silence, the story girl placed her parcel on the lowest step and laid her letter on the top of the pile. Her brown fingers trembled and her face was very pale. Suddenly, the door above us opened and Peg Bowen appeared on the threshold. She was a tall, sinewy old woman wearing a short, rugged, druggist skirt, a scarlet print blouse, and a man's hat. Her feet, arms, and neck were bare, and she had a battered old clay pipe in her mouth. Her brown face seamed with a hundred wrinkles, and her tangled, grisly hair fell unkemply on her shoulders. She was scowling, and her flashing black eyes held no friendly light. We had borne up bravely enough hitherto in spite of our inward, unconfessed quakings. But now our strained nerves gave way, and sheer panic seized us. Peter gave a little yelp of pure terror. We turned and fled across the clearing into the woods. Down the long hill we tore, like mad, hunted creatures. Firmly convinced that Peg Bowen was after us, wild was that scamper, at nightmare-like as any recorded in any dream book. The story girl was in front of me, and I recall the tremendous leap she made over fallen logs and little spruce bushes, with her long brown curls streaming out behind her from the scarlet f fillet. Cecily, behind me, kept gasping out the contradictory sentence, Oh, Bev, wait for me! Oh, Bev, hurry, hurry! More by blind instinct than anything else, we kept together and found our way out of the woods. Presently, we were in the field beyond the brook, over us, was a dainty sky of shell pink. Placid cows were pasturing around us, and farewell summer nodded to us in the friendly breeze. We halted with a glad realization that we were back in our own haunts, and that Peg Bowen had not caught us. Oh, wasn't that an awful experience? gasped Cecily, shuddering. I wouldn't go through it again. I couldn't, not even for Pat. It come on a fellow so sudden, said Peter shamefacedly. I think I could stood my ground if I didn't know she was going to come out. But when she popped out like that, I thought it was done for. We shouldn't have run, said Felicity gloomily. It showed we were afraid of her, and that was always makes her awful cross. She won't do a thing for Pat now. I don't believe she could do anything awful, said the story girl. I think 
We've just been a lot of geese. We were all, except Peter, more or less inclined to agree with her, and the conviction of our folly deeply when we reached the granary and found that Pat, watched over by faithful Sarah Ray, was no better. The story girl announced that she would take him into the kitchen and set up all night with him. He shan't die alone anyway, she said miserably, gathering his limp body up in her arms. We did not think Aunt Olivia would give her permission to stay up, but Aunt Olivia did. We wanted to stay with her also, but Aunt Janet wouldn't hear of such a thing. She ordered us off to bed, saying that it was positively sinful in us to be so worked up over a cat. Five heartbroken children, who knew that there are many worse friends than the dumb furry folks, climbed Uncle Alec's stairs to bed that night. There's nothing we can do now except pray God to make Pat better, said Cecily. I must candidly say that her tone savored strongly of a lost cause, but that was owing more to early trans training than to any lack of faith on Cecily's part. She knew, and we knew, that the prayer was a solemn rite, not to be lightly held, nor degraded to common use. Felicity voiced this conviction when she said, I don't believe it would be right to pray about a cat. I'd like to know why not, retorted Cecily. God made Patty just as much as he made you, Felicity King, though perhaps he didn't go to much trouble. And I'm sure he's abler to help him than Peg Bowen, anyhow. I'm going to pray for Pat with all my might and main, and I'd like to see you try and stop me. Of course, I won't mix it up with more important things. I'm just tacking it on after I've finished asking the blessing, but before I say I'm in. More petitions than Cecily's were offered up that night on behalf of Patty. I distinctly heard Felix, who always said his prayers in a loud whisper, owing to some lasting conviction of early life that God could not hear him if he did not pray audibly, muttered pleading, After that... The important part of the devotion was over. Oh, God, please make Pat better by morning, please do. And even I, in these late years of irreverence for the dreams of youth, am not in the least ashamed to confess that when I knelt down to say my boyish prayer, I thought of our little furry comrade in his extremity and prayed as reverently as I knew how for his healing. Then I went to sleep, comforted by the simple hope that the great father would, after important things were all attended to, remember poor Pat. As soon as we were up the next morning, we rushed off to Uncle Roger's, but we met Peter and the story girl in the lane, and their faces were as faces of those who bring glad tidings upon the mountain. Pat's better, cried the story girl, triumphant. Last night, just at twelve, he began to lick his paws, and then he licked himself all over and went to sleep. I went to sleep, too, on the sofa, and when I woke up, Pat was washing his face, and he had taken a whole saucer full of milk. Oh, isn't it splendid? You see, Peg Bowen did put a spell on him, said Peter, and then she took it off. I guess Cecily's prayers had more to do with Pat's getting better than Peg Bowen, said Felicity. She prayed for Pat over and over again, and that's why he's better. Oh, all right, said Peter. But I'd advise Pat not to scratch Peg Bowen again, that's all. I wish I knew whether it was the praying or the Peg Bowen that cured Pat, said Felix in perplexity. I don't believe it was either of them, said Dan. Pat just got sick and got better again, of his own accord. I'm going to believe that it was my praying, said Cecily decidedly. It's so much nicer to believe that God cured Pat than that Peg Bowen did it. "'But you oughtn't to believe a thing just cause it would be more comfortable,' objected Peter. "'Mind you, ain't saying God couldn't cure Pat. "'But nothing and nobody can ever make me believe that Peg Bowen wasn't at the bottom of it all.' "'Thus faith, superstition, and incredulity strove together against us, as in all history.'" Chapter 25 A Cup of Failure 
One warm Sunday evening, in the moon of goldenrod all over, grown-ups and children were sitting in the orchard of the pulpit stone, singing sweet old gospel hymns. We could all sing, more or less, except poor Sarah Ray, who had once despairingly confided to me that she didn't know what she was going to do in heaven because she couldn't sing a note. The whole scene comes out clearly to me in my memory, the arc of primrose sky over the trees behind the old house, the fruit-laden boughs of the orchard, the bank of goldenrod like a wave of sunshine behind the pulpit stone, the nameless color seen on the fir wood in a ruddy sunset. I can see Uncle Alec's tired, brilliant blue eyes, Aunt Janet's wholesome maternal face, Uncle Roger's sweeping blonde beard and red cheeks, and Aunt Olivia's full-blown beauty. Two voices rang out from me above all others in the music that echoed through the halls of recollection, Cecily's sweet silvery and Uncle Alec's fine tenor. "'If you're a king, you sing,' was a Carlisle proverb in those days. Aunt Julia had been the flower of the flock in that respect and had become a noted concert singer. The world had never heard of the rest. Their music echoed only along the hidden ways of life and served but a light the to lighten the cares of the trivial, round, common tasks. That evening, after they tired of singing, the grown-ups began talking of their youthful days and doings. It was always a keen delight to us, small fry, if we listened avidly to the tales of our uncle and aunts in the days when they, too, hard fact to realize, had been children, good and proper as they were now, once, so it seemed, they had gotten into mischief and even had their quarrels and disagreements. On this particular evening, Uncle Rogers told many stories of Uncle Edward, and one in which he said Edward had preached sermons at the mature age of ten from the pulpit stone, fired as the sequel will show the story girl's imagination. "'Can't I just see him now?' said Uncle Roger, leaning over the old boulder, his cheeks red and his eyes burning with excitement, being in the top, as if with all his might, and it wasn't cushioned, so he bruised his hand. However, he, we thought him a regular wonder. We loved to hear him preach, but we didn't like to hear him pray, because he always insisted on praying for each of us by name, and made us feel wretchedly uncomfortable.' Anyhow, Alec, do you remember how furious Julia was because Edward prayed one day she might be preserved from vanity and conceit over her singing? I should think I do, laughed Uncle Alec. She was sitting right there where Cecily is now, and she got up at once and marched right out of the orchard. But at the gate she turned and called back indignantly. I guess you'd better wait till you've prayed the conceit out of yourself before you begin on me, Ned King. I never heard such a stuck-up sermon as you preach. Ned went on praying and never let on he heard her, but at the end of his prayer he wound up with, O oh God, I pray you to keep an eye on us all, but I pray you pay particular attention to my sister Julia, for I think she needs it even more than the rest of us. World without end, amen. Our uncles roared with laughter over the recollection. We all laughed indeed, especially over another tale in which Uncle Edward, leaning too far over the pulpit in his earnestness, lost his balance altogether and tumbled in ungloriously to the grass below. He lit on a big scotch thistle, said Uncle Roger, chuckling, and besides that, he skinned his forehead on the stone. But he was determined to finish his sermon, and finish it he did. He climbed back into the pulpit with tears rolling over the cheeks, and preached for ten minutes longer with sobs in his voice and drops of blood on his forehead. He was a plucky little beggar. Now wonder he succeeded in life. And his sermons and prayers were always just about as outspoken as those Julia objected to, said Uncle Alec. Well, we're all getting on in life, and Edward is happy, but is gray now. But when I think of him, always see him a little rosy, curly-headed chap 
laying down the law to us from the pulpit stone. It seems like the other days that we were all here together, just as these children were, and now we are scattered everywhere. Julia in California, and Edward in Halifax, and Alan in South America. Felix and Felicity, and Stephen gone to the land that is far, far off. There was a little space of silence, and then Uncle Alec began in a low, impressive voice to repeat the wonderful verse of the 19th Psalm, verses which were henceforth bound up for us with the beauty of that night and the memories of our kindred. Very reverently we all listened to the majestic words, Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all the generations, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever Thou hadst formed the earth of the world. Even from everlasting to everlasting thou art God, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night, for all our days are passed away in the wreath, we spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are fourscore and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow." for it is soon cut off and we fly away. We So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. O oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. The dust crept into the orchard like a dim, bewitching personality. You could see her, feel her, hear her. She tiptoed softly through tree to tree, ever drawing nearer. Presently her filmy wings hovered over us, and through them gleamed the early stars of the autumn night. The grown-ups rose reluctantly and strolled away, but we children lingered for a moment to talk over the idea that the story girl broached. A good idea. We thought enthusiastically, and one that promised to add considerable spice to life. We were on the lookout for some new amusement. Dream books had begun to pale. We no longer wrote in them regularly, and our dreams were not what they used to be before the mischance of the cucumber. So the story girl's suggestion came pat to the psychologically moment. I've thought of a splendid plan, she said. It just flashed into my mind when the uncles were talking about Uncle Edward. And the beauty of it is we can play it on Sundays. And you know there are so few things it is proper to play on Sunday. But this is a Christian game, so it will be all right. It isn't like the religious fruit basket game, is it? asked Cecily anxiously. We had good reason to hope that it wasn't. One desperate Sunday afternoon, when we had nothing to read, and the time seemed endless, Felix had suggested that we have a game of fruit basket, only instead of taking the names of fruit, we were to take the names of the Bible characters. This, he argued, would make it quite lawful and proper to play on Sunday. We, too, desirous of being convinced, also thought it so, for a merry hour Lazarus and Martha and Moses and Aaron and sundry other worthy holy writ had a lively time of it in the king orchard peter having a scripture name of his own did not want to take another but we would not allow this because it would give him an unfair advantage over the rest of us it would be so much easier to call out your own name than fit your tongue to an unfamiliar one so peter reluctantly chose Nebuchadnezzar, which no one could ever utter three times, but Peter shrieked it out once. In the midst of our hilarity, however, Uncle Alec and Aunt Janet came down upon us. It is best to draw a veil over what followed. Suffice to say that the, re the recollection gave point to Cecily's question. No, it isn't that sort of game at all, said the story girl. It is this. Each of you boys must preach a sermon one of you next sunday and another the next and so on and whoever preaches the best sermon is to get a prize dan promptly declared he would not try and preach a sermon but peter felix and i thought the suggestion a very good one secretly i believed 
I could cut quite a fine figure preaching a sermon. Who'll give the prize? asked Felix. I will, said the story girl. I'll give that picture father sent me last week. As the said picture was an excellent copy of one of Landseer's stags, Felix and I were well pleased, but Peter averred that he would rather have the Madonna that looked like his Aunt Jane, and the story girl agreed that if his sermon was the best, she would give it to him. But who's to do the judging? I said, and what kind of sermon would you call the best? The one that makes the most impression, answered the story girl promptly, and we girls must be the judges, because there's nobody else. Now, who is to preach next Sunday? It was decided that I should lead off, and I lay awake for an extra hour that night, thinking that the text I should take for the following Sunday. The next day I brought two sheets of full scap from the schoolmaster, and after tea I betook myself to the granary, barred the door, and fell to writing my sermon. I had decided to preach on missions, as being the topic more within my grasp than abstruse theological doctrines or evangelical discourses, and mindful of the need of making an impression, I drew a harrowing picture of the miserable plight of the people who in their darkest bowed down to wood and stone. Then I urged our responsibility concerning them, and meant to wind up by reciting in a very solemn and earnest voice the verse beginning, Can we whose souls are lighted? When I had completed my sermon, I went over it very carefully again, and wrote with red ink. Cecily made it the word thump, however. I deemed it advisable to chastise the pulpit. It was finally time to give my sermon. I mounted the pulpit steps, feeling rather nervous, and my audience sat gravely down on the grass before me. Our opening exercise consisted solely of singing and reading. We had agreed to omit prayer. Neither Felix Peter nor I felt equal to praying in public. But we took up a collection. The proceeds were to go to the missions. Dan passed the plate, Felicity's rosebud plate, looking as preternaturally solemn as Elder Fruin herself. Every one put a cent on it. Well, I preached my sermon, and it fell horribly flat. I realized that before I was halfway through it, I think I preached it very well, and never a thump did I forget to misplace. But my audience was plainly bored. When I stepped down from the pulpit after demanding passionately, if we whose souls are lighted, and so forth, I felt with secret humiliation that my sermon was a failure. It had made no impression at all. Felix would be sure to get the prize. That was a very good sermon for a first attempt, said the story girl graciously. It sounded just like a real sermon I've heard. For a moment, the charm of her voice made me feel that I had some hope. Every word of it is true, said Cecily, her tone unconsciously implying that that was the sole merit. I often feel, said Felicity primly, that we don't think enough about the heathens. We ought to think a great deal more of them and give more money. Sarah Ray put the finishing touch on my mortification. It was so nice and short, she said. What was the matter with my sermon, I asked Dan that night. Since it was neither judge nor competitor, I would discuss the matter with him. It was too much like a regular sermon to be interesting, said Dan frankly. I should think the more like a regular sermon it would be better, I said. Not if you want to make an impression, said Dan seriously. You must have something sort of different for that. Peter, now, he'll give something different. Oh, Peter, I don't believe he can preach a sermon, I said. Maybe not, but you'll see. He'll make an impression, said Dan. Dan was neither the prophet nor the son of a prophet, but he had the second sight for once. Peter did make an impression.' 